How's it going, everybody? We'll get started here in the next couple of minutes.
All right. We're about at the top of the hour here. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, my name is Logan. I'm one of the newest engineers here at the SAS Alerts team. I, I might be joined and flanked by a few other SAS Alerts uh, people here today. Uh, but Ben and Anthony, who usually are leading this, they're, they're out this week. Um, just invite a few other people in here. Hello, Logan. Hello, everybody. Hey, Chip. How are we all doing today? Doing good. I think we've got about a quorum here. We're a minute now past the hour. And just and, and, and just to reset, um, welcome, everyone. My name is Logan Guzman. Uh, I'm one of the newest engineers here at SAS Alerts. I'm stepping in while Ben and Anthony are out this week. Uh, Chip is here, at, who's also going to help. Um, lead the call as well. Um, just to start off and um, ask, is there anything at top of mind, anything that you all uh, have been noticing after going through your platforms, anything to talk about this week that's top of mind? Well, Man, well we're, really, we're really quiet without the two Brady bunches. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> They're not here to, uh, <laughs> yeah. What have, I, what have I been missing, Enrique? <laughs> Man, we have a whole bunch of fun. We actually wanted a daily instead of every other week. Daily? Holy cow. <laughs> usually, usually Anthony, the chatterbox that he is, he's got something smart to bring up and say. Um, it looks like, it looks like David's having a great time in respond always always good to hear always good to hear that respond is acting acting accordingly we've got it scoped and tuned how we want it to be here while we might be thinking about something to talk about i just wanted to bring up a um, managed sas alerts is something that uh you may have heard us talk about recently um we do have a webinar for managed sas alerts that's coming up on september the 10th I put in the link for the webinar. I just wanted to make sure that that invite, if you haven't already been um, notified of that, I just wanted to rehash that, make sure that those of you who want to join, please uh, jump in and join us there. Um, I, I, I really look forward to uh, that webinar where we'll be able to have a deep dive into the plans of managed SAS alerts uh, and what that's gonna look for like us here. So I got my question here. Do we have a deadline? A deadline for? The submitting our questionnaire for the onboarding? Um, managed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, as soon as possible. We definitely want um, everyone, we, you know, our goal is to have everybody onboarded by the 30th of this month um, so that we hit the ground running. We're a little over halfway there in terms of, um partners who have responded, everybody that has responded is fully onboarded. Um, so if you can jump all over that, Enrique, if you're signed up for MSA, Whoops. please do. I did sign up and I've gotten two emails to move my behind. So I'm a little behind. All right, let's get I'll cracking, get Enrique. Week. I get it this week. It only, it, it, it's a five minute process for you to just get return that form. Um, Since and so I was in fourth grade to up to today, Whenever I see a form, I get scared and run. So I don't know why. <laughs> Who's your account manager, Enrique? Uh, Connor. Connor. Okay. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll ask. I'll no, see I have the form. They've emailed it twice to me. Well, so. if you're scared, you know, maybe Connor can look over your shoulder and help you with that. I just well, need to do it. The number one thing that we need, Enrique, and and for anyone else who is signed up for MSA, um, 
for you know as for our go to launch on September one. The number one th thing we need you to do is set up the MSA service account so that those team members can you know work with your team to customize the environment, um, and that's really the primary goal. So that if you know more than anything else, we need that um, to to finish your onboarding. Excellent. I'll get it this week. That'd be great. I'm in a peaceful place. So. I can see that. Hey, not for nothing, but what am I missing? What are, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about a new um, service offering that begins September 1st for any partners who who want it um, called Manage SAS Alerts. And what that is, is our team is taking over um, in, in collaboration with the MSP, um, the, the tuning and day-to-day um, and -day, uh, respond rule creation, making sure that rules, uh, when they're triggered, that they're followed up, that the partner is notified with um, a complete pre and post analysis to um, an, an alert trigger so that you know exactly what is going on with the account, kind of setting everything up so that when you go the last mile to talk to your customer in the event of a compromise or a suspected compromise that you've got all the information at your fingertips. Um, this has been put together in really borrowing from the combined knowledge of the, the entire community. We have a lot of partners who are absolutely great at this, are very, very mature in their security journey. Um, and for those guys, they don't need that kind of assistance. Um, but there are, you know, a lot of partners, we're up over 70 partners now that have um, decided to subscribe to Manager Sazzlers. It is an extra fee because um, we've actually hired a dedicated team to uh, to support that program. Um, it's, I believe, we, we were running a special for the initial for your inaugural launch, that it would be an additional 50 cents per account. Um, I'm honestly not sure where the pricing is going to go from there. I think it's going to be more like 75 um, as we move forward. Per account, so per customer, 50 cents a month? Per 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 monitored account, the same way we charge per, everything okay. else in SAS alerts. So per endpoint? Yes. I mean, we don't think in terms of endpoints in SAS alerts because we think in terms of accounts the account is the endpoint in our view um but close to that you know steven there's a very there's close to a one to one correlation between accounts and endpoints got it anyone else have have questions about either that program or anything else Ooh. Just a comment, we were able to get all the tenants we have on business premium onboarded to the uh, Defender integration for the beta. The last one we had an issue was it got blocked for risky behavior. So that's where we're having issue with one of the last tenants. But once we removed that risky behavior, we were able to get it online. So that's working well. That's good. That's great to hear. Yeah, after the webinar um, that we did on Defender, which was, was that last week? Beginning of last week? I think so. Uh, we jumped from eight people that wanted to participate in the beta up to 92. Um, so that that changed things very, very quickly. And we we definitely want as many, as many people who have Defender um, as part of their 365 subscription for their customers, we absolutely want as many people in that beta as we can, because the more data we collect, the better we can refine um, the interface really between the Defender for Endpoint events that are occurring and the events that are occurring in the SaaS products. The end goal with Defender for Business and data is to try to correlate to the user and identify behaviors or something like that. Um, that's, I'd say that's an initial goal. Um, the end goal for any um, EDR that we're going to begin monitoring would actually be able to have SAS alerts 
either directly or through um, other agents that are on the endpoint actually take action on the endpoint as well. Um, you know, we would want to we would want to try and turn it into a respond like functionality, where let's say an endpoint um, was compromised, there was an you know active encryption going on on that endpoint from a ransomware attack. Um, we would want to be able to secure that account, shut it down. Um, if the account can be purely managed in the cloud, which most are, um, go through the steps of um, alerting the user, probably blocking the sign in immediately until the user can be contacted, work them through changing their password securely, those sorts of things. So just another level of helping the MSP um, automatically respond to a threat um, and shut things down before they can get get worse. Expands so kind of whichever users link to that device or users uh, exactly they're, they're compromise on the device you're going to turn around and do like we do today with a 365 respond that's uh, what we'd like to do Enrica you talked about end goal so that that's a much longer journey um, there aren't necessarily endpoints that are available in the EDR systems to allow for that um, but we're working on that and we're we will be bringing other EDRs. Um, forward as well. Sentinel-1 is already in development. Um, Datto is already in development. So we're, you know, we're bringing forth this functionality beyond just the Microsoft Defender uh, Defender suite, you know, acknowledging that most of our partners, interestingly enough, don't you use Microsoft Defender today as part of their solution with their customers. Sentinel-1 is the most popular um, of the products that we have out there now. Um, I think I think a big chunk of that is Microsoft's fault because they didn't make Defender for Endpoint available um, at the lower subscription levels for a long time. They had it behind a paywall. Now that they brought it down to business based or business premium, um, it's a lot more rational decision uh, for the partner and their customer. Yeah, we we can convince our customers to jump up to the twenty two dollars. You can or cannot. Cannot. Yeah. Most of them are paying twelve fifty for business standard. Yeah, uh, when they need the apps, or six dollars when they don't need the apps. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a pretty big jump. Though we can't sell them on value. Yep, I don't know if they even value us. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Mario, the answer to your question is no. Um, we will not be charging extra for uh for the defender monitoring feature. It, it's been our policy. Um, Mario and, and for anyone who's relatively new in as a in a partner relationship with us that when we add um, additional SaaS applications that we're monitoring or additional endpoints um, and EDR products like this that we're monitoring we don't charge extra for that um, MSA is a little bit different managed SaaS alerts we call it MSA is a little different because that is requiring a, a significant um, staff to provide 24 or 365 um, interaction with your partner tenant. And um, obviously we don't, we don't take the relationship down to the client side, to your clients, but we are monitoring the activity in your partner tenant uh, 24, 365 with a live team. So that's why there's an additional charge for the MSA, MSA service. So since it's office hours and it's open mic, I'll ask a question, which just, is there anything in the roadmap regarding, we're looking at different tools today or working with one of them that we basically back up all the Intune policies, back up all the uh, conditional access policies, pretty much all the policies from Huntrum, whether they're device or user. Uh, and then we also monitor if there's any changes, but really simplifies. There's ZIP does it in some sort of way, but not completely the same. Is there any, in the future roadmap, I know there's a lot of things you guys are doing with policies. Uh, would the end goal be kind of to be able to be the one source for all our Microsoft policies, whether they're Intune or Entra? Um, I mean, in, in a sense, that's what Fortify is. Sorry, guys, I got to plug my computer in. That's what Fortify is. Um, you know, Fortify is keeping track of all of the policies that have been applied. There are already both Entra uh, and Intune policies, um, you know, policy management in Fortify, and there's a lot more to come um, in Fortify. Um, 
primarily around Intune, and we're also bringing Intune um, into the Unify stack as well. So the you know there'll be policy management of Intune policies and device configuration and so forth uh, within Fortify. Unify um, will obviously pick up devices that are assigned to specific users uh, and make that information even more reliable than it is today, where we get the information only from uh, the RMM uh, and for those MSPs who use Entra. I mean, you'd be surprised how many MSPs do not leverage Entra uh, and join devices to the 365. In fact, it's most. Um, you know, again, Intune is one of those things that they brought down in price. So there, it's, a, it's much more available now to a much broader cross section of MSP customers. So I would expect to see a lot of adoption there. Um, honestly, my personal view, this is not necessarily the official Sazzler stance on the subject, but my personal view is that over time, Intune is going to take over um, a significant portion, if not nearly all, of the functionality of, of what we do with RMMs today. It's capable of doing that. That's, that's the direction that Microsoft seems to be taking it. It's a complete device management solution, soup to nuts, including installing software and doing updates and everything else. Um, and if all of that is packaged for, you know, Windows, iOS, um, Mac OS, and Linux, um, and obviously Android devices, as well, that's packaged into one product, I would see that it's going to have a significant impact uh, on the use of RMMs. If I were starting an MSP today myself, if I were going to redo that, that part of my business career, I would be building my stack around um the the principle that Intune would be the core management device layer for everything. So just FYI, we try to get every user, uh, most of our users do not use domain controllers or customers. They have local work group, local accounts, no administration over them. Mm -hmm. So obviously when we do some type of PAM, we're, we're able to remove all that admin access and control it, but we join even the $6 Microsoft basic license mm -hmm. allows you Entra AD joined. Yeah, even absolutely. License. So we get every user to sign. Obviously, they have to have Windows Pro or Windows Business License on the machine, but we try to get every customer uh, slowly to that. And we're probably about halfway to join them because, again, there's no other way to have visibility uh, or be able to know exactly what's going on. Or if there's a compromised account, be able to shut down even the log into the computer. So, uh, yeah, that, that is definitely a great tool. We use Intune on the business premium side, my Mac OS, iOS devices. Um, it's definitely getting better and better and better. Uh, we log into Mac with uh, platform SSO, Mac or Entra credentials to log onto the Mac. Uh, so yeah, they're definitely getting better and it's just, they're too complicated. That's why we also use Nerdio for Azure Virtual Desktops and, and they have the module for controlling Intune and make it a little easier or simpler to do. But going back to the policies, right now, I mean, we have all your modules and 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 with Fortify, we have templates and policies we can push. But what would be great would be be able to suck up all the policies from a tenant into SAS alerts instead of just having, because right now we could build templates and push to the tenants. It would be great if we can go into a tenant and pull in all the policies uh, that Microsoft supports today. Pull in every policy. Um, it's so, configured in the tenant. Yeah. So when you say um, pull them all in, are you thinking like in a report format or pull them all in and then be able to manipulate the policies inside of SAS alerts? The ideal goal well, is, but well, the ideal goal is be able to, like one of the tools we use or we tested and haven't signed up, uh, we've been kind of pushing back on it is, like, let's say at one MSP tenant, that's our base level tenant. We configure everything from there. We pull it into the platform and then we could use that to deploy to all our other tenant at best practices. And then every night it's monitoring, which we're doing that with Bruce. Every night they're monitoring if there's any change in a certain policy and it comes back and tells you, hey, Intune change defender uh, allow list. These were the changes that were made, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead of just doing templates like we do today on SAS alerts and having to wait for those templates to be built, I'm not sure how complicated it is to bring those policies in and create the templates from that. Um, 
it's probably not very complicated to be honest with you. We're ninety percent the way there as it is. I mean, in order to have constructed Fortify and be providing policy recommendations, we're connecting to the same API endpoint that would allow us to just ingest what's there and yep. demonstrate it. So, um, it's a good suggestion. I like it. Um, you know, we're. I don't need to ask anyone to take notes because I see a bunch of people have note takers going, and I'm sure we're recording this, but. Um, I'll have a chat with the Fortify team um, about taking that step. I think the first thing we do, Enrique, because I, we try and think in a crawl, walk, run, fly kind of mentality is the first thing we would do would be to actually build that out as a report. You know, here's where all the policies are at this moment. Um, couple that in, you know, in the reports module so that you guys could send it to your customers with your logos on it and stuff give them uh, and then have the recommendations matched up right to that report. So, um, I mean, we're, we're almost there now. If you look at the reports in, in Fortify, the, um, the threat summary report does provide the actions that have been taken in Fortify, those that have yet to be applied that are recommendations. And then across the top, I don't know if you've ever seen that report, there's a line graph that, that actually shows you drift uh, on the score. And then obviously when policy changes are made, it, those are picked up inside SAS alerts as just regular events. So, you know, all that information is already there. I think, I think it sounds like we need to package it in a way that you're describing. Yeah. Cause it would save us from buying another tool. And I know if I make changes on the Microsoft side, like let's say at the beginning, I went gung ho and turned on everything, all the anti-spam, anti-this and and then I started getting crippled tenants. So I modified it on the Microsoft side. And when I came back into, into Fortify, it was modified as well or turned off. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it is obviously bi-directional. Yeah, it definitely is. One of the challenges is that unlike um, regular event logging, policy updates don't come as quickly from Microsoft. It's more like a you know, once every 24 hours that we get a, a, a refresh view of what the policy state is. Yeah, these guys send a, a, a 2 a.m. report, I believe, if there was any changes. Mm -hmm. And it's basically in a JSON format, just showing what changed. Man, I, I, we're going to leave Ben and Anthony out and have you, Chip, more often on the call. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one talking, Enrique. I think, you know, if this is lively when Ben and Anthony are here, then I must be the buzzkill of the, you know, of the office hours. Come on, guys. Let's entice him to come in more often. I think we're missing a couple of usual suspects. Maybe they're on vacation like you are, Enrique. Well, I'm on working vacation. I'm working. in Reckon, Colorado for a couple of weeks. So that's last week you all saw on the call or someone mentioned on there. That's the first Enrique driving and participating in SAS Alerts call. Uh, the RV. So, yeah. So you have a camper parked behind you there. You're at a campsite up in Breckenridge. Oh, nice. Big class A. Yep. It's my baby. I'm glad my wife is not looking over my shoulder because she wants us to move up from our toe behind to something like that. Yeah, it, it's especially with kids. It, I mean, it, you're just adults. I think you're fine towing, but when you get in with kids and stuff and bathroom breaks on long trips, it just makes it so nice to have everyone in one compartment. You just keep rolling. I just keep rolling. It's, it's a, I stop at Walmart's to sleep when I'm traversing from spot to spot, I don't even go into camps. Yeah. Uh, we see that a lot. I'm in the you know. morning when I wake up, everyone's asleep. I just take off shower and take off. And sometimes I get to destination and everyone's still asleep. So yeah, it makes it really nice. Yeah. yeah. The, the closest shopping center to me is a super Walmart. And right next to it is a Cabela's. What do you think that looks like in the summertime? Oh, it's packed. a camper parking lot. Jam packed. We're way off topic though. I'm not sure yeah. where that one's going to take us. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly where I live, David. What else did we talk about on the last office hours? I think we, no, we didn't cut it short. 
Logan, did did uh, Anthony and Ben tee you up with a topic that they wanted you to get into today? No, it's really a free form for uh, really just reaching out and asking for any questions. Wanted to just, again, revisit that we have the Managed SaaS Alerts um, webinar on September 10th. For those of y'all that are maybe needing to save some more time that you that you yourself are spending inside SaaS Alerts, we now have a managed team um, that is working under Ben, who usually joins these calls. Uh, that link in the in the comment there. Um, if anyone's interested who joined late, uh, please join in. Uh, we'll be diving in, into the details of the managed SaaS Alerts ser uh, service that will be available, but. Um, really, besides mentioning uh, the managed SaaS alerts, it was just uh, wanted to open the floor for any questions. Is there anything else top of mind for anyone else out there? Something that you're working on a project um, that you'd like to talk about today? Come on, guys. Somebody come up with something because this is the first time I've met Logan. He's that new. I've been told by our team that he's a fantastic sales engineer and has picked everything up really quickly. So somebody put him to the test. Oh, no. <laughs> Enrique's got his hand up. He's, he's still speak? wanting to Can drive the bus. <laughs> so quick question, going back to you mentioned the EDRs you're working on, uh, Sentinel-1, Data EDR, imagine the info site. Um, anything on the Rocket Cyber side? Because uh, obviously Data EDR is one component, Rocket Cyber monitors a whole bunch of other stuff. Sure. Um well, Rocket Cyber has done their own integration to us, which is... Yes, I have that since December. Yes. Yeah. So um, so we're not pursuing anything beyond that. Um, you know, they're free to extend that as far as they want. And they have our 100% cooperation. In fact, you know, they asked us to do a few things with our API to make it easier uh, for them, which we did. We accommodated. So, um, you know, we, we love what they're doing. We're happy to see them um you know wrap our services into what they're doing um you know we're definitely not a full-blown sock managed SAS alerts is not full-blown sock uh i'm kind of glad you brought that up because it's important to make that clarification people sometimes want to i think confuse the possibility that we're turning into uh a security operations center business and we're definitely not that's that's not the you know the the goal of of the managed SAS alert service so uh, but no, no, nothing, nothing further with Rocket Cyber unless they come to us and say, "Here's something else that we want to do." So if you have a suggestion for them, Enrique, to put on their roadmap, um, <laughs> feel free. To, I believe it's Jim Freely, who's a product manager for Rocket Cyber. I'll reach out to him because they do have a lot of. So since we turned on Defender immediately, we started getting those alerts inside Rocket Cyber, the Defender beta, uh, mm -hmm. which we get directly as well on on that side, but. I think there's some very valuable information that they monitor, uh, RDPs, uh, some other risky behaviors outside of Microsoft that uh, could be interesting to correlate for auto response. Right. Rocket Cyber has their own agent, correct? That goes on devices. Yeah. So, so they've got a, you know, they have a lot of flexibility to do things that we don't do. You know, we've remained agentless very intentionally um we've had internal discussions about whether or not we should build an agent and um our philosophy still is that there's so many agents out there that the last thing the msps need is another agent so we're you know we're leveraging the capabilities of existing products that have agents uh to do what we need to do yeah i'll reach i'll, I'll let them know see because i think it's i'll let them know about this initiative you guys are doing and and see what they can pitch your way because i think it would be very valuable i consider you guys are our, our robotic uh mdr because uh, i mean at the end of the day there's one thing certain in life is you cannot stop a 365 breach or a google um, breach or a salesforce breach yeah you yep, know, yep. You, and can, you, can, you can prevent breaches through minimize. hygiene and security posture management right that's the only thing that prevents them but when when the hacking community finds a way to bypass even your best controls, they're going to happen. The trick is spotting them fast and shutting them down before significant damage gets done. Correct. And that to us is that we, we firmly believe it's the most valuable tool we have in our tool stack. Because, I mean, we could detect they're encrypting a machine, isolate it, maybe stop the encryption, kill a process. 
but the only tool that could really, I shouldn't use the word guarantee, but that gives us a very high problem because their API could fail. There's a lot of different things that can happen, but um, that can give us a high probability of doing some type of remediation. Obviously that five, 10, 15 minutes, there could be damage done. Uh, but obviously that's, oh, I have a great one for you. Uh, that's something that we know and we feel comfortable uh, you guys auto remediating. And, and I think that's a very powerful tool. One thing that would be amazing would be we use SIP and not chip, but SIP. And mm -hmm. we have, they have a BC compromise. So if you feel a user's been compromised, you just hit a button that'll automatically go pull all the rules that have been created besides blocking the user doing what auto respond does. It'll go pull reports as to the last login activities, uh, any mail forwarding rules created, uh, any forward, any rules within the mailbox. So I think that could be something that would be neat to have an auto respond. So not just, we don't have to go to another tool to run that BEC report, but when you guys auto respond, kind of pull that, uh, that data. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we will get there because that's one of the responsibilities of the MSA team. Uh, as you know, right now, you know, when, when you do have an event, it's really up to the MSP technicians to use our analysis feature and go look at that. What happened 10 minutes before an hour before what happened then the hour after that compromise detected, you guys are doing that on your own. That's one of the things that the MSA team will package up for you. So I, I suspect we're going to have a lot of uh, motivation to automate that moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, because that gives us a simple view. And anytime we have an issue or even a scare, uh, we go into SIP and pull that report. And then they offer, there's another tool you could use with PowerShell, I think Hawk Tool or something like that to get more in depth. But very valuable to kind of see uh, what else happened besides the login and try to minimize that damage, even though it's already blocked. Yep. Steven, did you want to jump in here? I see you 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 posted a a mini paragraph. I I, I always I, I try to write things down. Um, I some of the stuff we're working on is trying to get some NIST specific templates and you know four to five stuff created. Um, I did I did like uh, I I used that recently. I basically exported all of the things that had like NIST mappings and showed it to the showed it to the IT team for one of our customers. And yeah, we're going to try to try to implement as many of those as we can um, as like, you know, users, they want to be SF 2.0 level as their goals. And so we can start targeting settings that are relevant there. And so, yeah, trying to get a right combination of fortify templates that match the licensing that they actually have. Um, yeah, which is kind of a mix of kind of business premium you know, yep. sort of level stuff. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a big, one. and yeah, we just read it with roost. So, um, so that there was an integration there. So we're going to be, uh, looking to see what's possible on that, that side as well. Yeah. A couple, couple of comments. Um, first one is your account manager can send you um in a pdf format so that it's easy to use with your customers are every, all of our events and how they're mapped to nist and cis we actually have a document like you can get that information from fortify but if you want something that's really easy um to go through with customers we we have that pre-built um we're in the process right now of re-updating cis because they just had some changes but um you can just ask your account manager about that and they can send it to you um okay yeah i mean a lot the 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 vulnerability assessment report you can you can get a lot out of that with if you mm -hmm. uh if you export and so I've, I've found some good success there yeah um roost is is very intriguing to me because it, it's i'm not sure if it's the first or the second time i guess probably rocket cyber is the first time that there was just an organic you know pop-up of somebody integrating with us but the roost community has gotten very busy i'm aware that there's a Discord server out there that um, SAS alerts and Roost customers are kind of banging ideas around back and forth and um, sharing automations. So, you know, I, I think there's a, an awful lot of potential there. Um, we know the Roost team pretty well um, and, you know, talk right. with them quite regularly. So 
Uh, I think it's a great combination. That's def for me. That's the 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 Reese's peanut butter cup of the, you know, of the security monitoring world is Sazzlers and Roots together. Yeah, there's some cool capabilities. I already want to. Um, was talking with our owner about it, but uh, we I I I, I took the time to build a Power Automate uh, or just a, just a form and a flow uh, approval process for one org um, to do travel requests. Uh, with uh, so we know they're coming to a location or going at a time frame, and so it's great to be able to do that. But to do that, you know, forty times is uh, annoying. And so, um, yeah, I think we can get a form pretty much replicated that all of our customers could just use. Create the and ticket you, that we get. Are you using our API um, along with Roos to trigger updates to their approved locations? Um, no, but, um, yeah, it would be nice to be able to add kind of right from the ticket, even if we, yeah. could, you, you know, grab you, a location, maybe from that. the form. Yeah. You definitely can do that. You could put that automation together that would, you know, get the form, um, trigger an API call on our side that would modify the country. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you know, you could get sophisticated enough with that actually with your own, on your own development side, you could actually trigger it. Uh, to revert back to its original settings on the date their travel ended. Like all of that is possible. There's people doing stuff like that now. Yeah, you've got, yeah, you've got time date fields, I bet. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm excited to learn how, uh, you know, learn how to use it. So. I know Jack about Roost. I just know we developed my first crate with the rock engineers. We have weekly calls and I just tell them the ideas and the PowerShell commands and they build it and we go back and forth. And that was, we did one for auto remediating Microsoft 365 quota limits when a mailbox hits the limit. The next one I had was that for impossible travel to be able to cloud radio, give them a form where they could say, we're traveling from this date to this date, and these are the countries we're visiting. So that would automatically go into SAS alerts and put in the different countries from X day to X day. And once it expires, remove them and leave them back at regular status quo. So make sure you share, Stephen, if you beat us to it. Oh yeah, that that sounds great. The other yeah, the other side I was interested in is yeah, the documentation sort of angle. And so yeah, we're yeah, we're big hands of line guard, but there's a lot of gaps that we end up with. And so hoping to be able to increase visibility into I mean, you know, onboarding status and stuff like that. Um, you know, I I like the overview um sort of level information and so yeah, it'll be, be cool just to be able to you know, maybe pull that in somewhere. So, yeah. Anything yeah I love else? the I love the overview map. Um, yeah, it looks like I saw somebody pop up. Uh, have a hit from uh, Alaska. So somebody is having some equally nice scenery as you. It looks like. <laughs> Oh, I did not Hopefully in a camper or on a boat. Yep. Yeah, we have a pretty good spread. So, Chip, any, has Microsoft has had any issues or you guys had any issues pulling? So I have a, when I'm back in the office, I have a dedicated about 12 by 12 inches of a monitor to SAS alerts map through the reports. So I have that map constantly on. And so I know by heart all the different, pop-ups red yellow or green that come up across the world for our users or our customers and lately i reported it a while back because i believe there was some some type of broken or something disconnected between you guys and microsoft pulling in that data but i guess i mean not, not that i want to see dots it's good not to see dots uh but i'm just you don't want to you don't want to not see dots where there should be dots well, correct. Exactly. I I don't want to see dots if there's no dots, because that means that's a good thing. But I, I'm just concerned. And so we use Dato Knock from India. So we're constantly getting their their, their pop-ups of their logins into IT Glue and into RMM. So we know it's that part's working. But on the Microsoft side, all of a sudden we see minimal attacks. And the other day I got a through Rocket Cyber, I got a we use we try to push onto P2. Uh, to customers uh, for uh, to get the risky alerts and a whole bunch of different behavior policies you can do. Uh, 
and I did see a risky alert for a user, but I did not see a pop up on the SAS alerts map. Hmm. Um, no. I wonder where that came from, if it came from Rocket Cyber or us to begin with. No, it came from Rocket. So we have Defender for Business integrated as well through the API of Rocket Cyber. So we get double source. We get from the Rocket Cyber connection to Microsoft and we get the SAS alerts ingestion into, into Rocket Cyber. Right. Interesting. I'd have to look into it, Enrique. I mean, there, getting data from Microsoft is a nonstop battle. Um, and it's a battle because their API limits are, what's the right word, convoluted. Um, they have different restrictions on how many calls request for data per minute uh, for for many different APIs. I wouldn't say for every single one, but they're kind of in groups. Um, and then they have different ways of calculating that. So most of them, they calculate on the tenant itself. And um, some of them, they calculate on the vendor, us being the vendor, others being the tenant. So the vendor side is actually really easy for us to handle. We have pretty complicated logic that makes sure that we don't blow through the, um, the vendor side uh, at all, ever. But on the customer side, if the customer has a limit and you have, or the customer has two or three or four different enterprise apps installed that are accessing Microsoft data, um, the customers can run over a limit and we can't control that. And that can introduce delays and it occasionally can introduce an event that gets missed for days um, be because of that behavior. So that's a much more challenging one for us to deal with. There's no way for us to, calculate what the other products are doing. Like there's no log that we can go to that says, you know, Sazzler's used 10% of the quota of this. And um, I don't know, LionGuard used 10% and whatever other products use 10%. Somebody, you know, dropped a bomb in there and then used up the other 70%, you know, it, that, that the combined three didn't. Uh, and now everybody is on timeout and, you know, until that resets. I so, did not know we had a limit. Um, that that makes it if we have two million enterprise apps <laughs> that could definitely be a problem yeah if you want some interesting reading that's guaranteed to either put you to sleep or make you pull your hair out um, just google microsoft graph api limits um, and start reading through that article and look at all the different ways they slice and dice um, query limits for for the for the graph um, exchange and uh, an azure logging service They're, they they it's mind boggling. Like you'd think they would just say, wouldn't it be easier if they would just say, okay, you know, if you have 10 users uh, in your tenant, then you should have, I don't know, a thousand requests per minute as a limit. And if you have a hundred users, it should be 10,000. If you have 5,000 users, it should be 5 million. Like they could just, they can make it very easy on everyone um, to, to lay that out based upon the size of the tenant, but they don't do that. Interesting. The other thing Microsoft does that they, you know, they, they, I'm sure we've talked about this on Thursday SASE calls at some point or another, but um, Microsoft also just will sometimes limit their production of data to any third party service so that they have a term in their documentation called resource conflict, um, which is a way of saying if their data center or infrastructure is too busy based upon whatever load is going on that we may or may not know about, who knows? Maybe Microsoft is dealing with a global DDoS, by the way, which they do all the time. Um, you know, they're under constant attack at a level that none of us even know about. Um, but they may, if they're if they have resource conflict, meaning that they don't have enough compute, um, RAM, CPU. Uh, to do what the, what their primary mission is, which is, you know, I think their number one mission is to take in emails and attachments and help people get them to SharePoint. If you think about like how it really breaks down, that's what 365 is all about. Um, and if they if they are having resource conflicts, they'll they will ra ratchet down the faucet for everybody else who's trying to get data. Well, they have major issues right now because we have Azure Virtual Desktops in US South Central there in San Antonio. And we, two weeks ago, we started having issues where host, we turn them off and they turn on on demand in the morning. Host pools weren't being able to turn on because there was no CPU capacity. 
So that started happening. Obviously, Nerdio has a good capacity extender to work around and use different type of cores to get yep. the machine up and going. And right now we're trying to deploy a new customer in there. And we got an email back from Microsoft asking if we can deploy it in Canada. And I'm like, these guys are in Mexico. Why the hell do we want to deploy in Microsoft Canada? Because they're out of resources. They can't provide. The best I can do is Canada. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Well, right? all I can say is I'm glad I'm not in that business anymore. That was two <laughs> companies ago for me. And I'm glad to be out of it. Nerdy will makes it easy. So, or as easy as can be. Yeah. Look, that's a model I always liked when I was running an MSP, um, that's the model that we used for everybody. I didn't want to be rolling trucks anymore to do updates. Um, and that was that was the real driver for us to move into the virtual desktop world. And that turned into a software product, you know, that we sold for many years. So um, I, I definitely understand the space. I thought that was the most sensible way at the time. And this was really before SaaS applications were everywhere. It was the most sensible way to manage security um, for any customer, you could get everybody locked up into an environment that, you know, you as the MSP had direct control over the data layer, um, the network layer, the virtual network layer, you know, all they needed was an internet connection and away they go. It's more expensive um, and, you know, sort of complicated than an, than an operation that can just run in pure SaaS, um, do everything in 365 or Google Workspace and, you know, QuickBooks Online or, you know, one of the Sage products online, Salesforce, whatever. Um, so I think SaaS has sort of changed that landscape, but um, it's still a very, very tight security model. And which is the reason that we did it back in the early aughts. Billy mentioned a comment about uh, if, if there were, if uh, the ability to add a filter to the account activity dashboard um, and, you know, outside of maybe lowering the severity that's causing those N365 backups, if that's something that you don't want to do and just kind of tune that activity out altogether, um, adding some sort of filter to, to the, to the account activity page does seem like a good idea. Um, Chip, do you know if we have anything on the backlog for that or, or anything that we can use to address that right now? Um, we don't have anything in the backlog. That's the first time someone's come up with that suggestion. And I agree. That's a pretty good suggestion. A, a, you know, allow a setting so that you guys can filter really any event or group of events um, so that they don't appear on the map. That's a good idea. But the, one other comment, Billy, on the backup side, um, I don't know which backup product you, you're using. If, if you're seeing... Um, that the backups themselves are blowing through the file limits that you have set on users. That means that the backup product that is one that no one else has told us about um, because we do, we do have a specific section of our code that we update literally on the fly. It's basically a library of all the backup services that people use. And if they're triggering uh, the file activity, um, you know, mostly they would look, they would show up looking like downloads. Um, then we'll add that to the list and they won't be blowing up um, your file trigger events. And, and Stephen, for the schedule reports improvements, are you maybe looking to add more customability to the frequency of those schedule reports? What's, what's the kind of updates that you're looking at? specifically for that or uh, yeah is uh, the i think the reports are you know real useful i think you know, maybe being able to like you know, duplicate or you know just uh you know create them create them a little bit easier or you know maybe multi-select in the in the listing there just a little bit of uh your your creation of those because i might you have a few multi-select that i want yeah, let me stop you there for a second, Stephen. Do you want to multi-select the customers that you're sending to, or do you you want to multi-select? Let's say you have a, a bundle of full reports you want every customer to get every month. Yeah, there's there's a few there's a few reports that I want to have them have them get every month, and we may send it to a Teams channel, for example. 
um, that we use for the clients. Yeah, you can so, send them to Teams channels now, right? Yeah, so we're doing that, but it's it, it's a little tedious setting up, you know, four scheduled reports for each tenant as we're onboarding them. It'd be it'd be nice to have a I don't know a little bit easier way to, you know, I was thinking you know duplicate a schedule and then I could update. Yeah. Definitely, I would that write one up as a as an enhancement request and and give it to your a, AM. That's how the process begins with us. We, you know, we're a super audited company, so unfortunately, even though we're only fifty people, we have a process for everything. Um, but that'll trigger that chain. The reports group is very active; they're always working on new stuff um, for that product. So, you know, enhancements and reports actually take usually take quite a bit less time to get in than the stuff that's going on and manage and respond just because it's not as complicated a product, but um, we'd be happy to look yeah. at it. Cool. Yeah. Cause I, anything to get that, uh, you know, into the hands of the users or you know, POCs, it's a lot of useful information for those and uh, that could make it easier to roll out. Thanks. Well, you see, Chip, you weren't so bad after all. You got motion. <laughs> I'm still waiting for somebody to come up with something to challenge Logan on a how do I. Make him share his screen and walk us all through it. <laughs> Logan, how do I tell autorespond to look at the device? And if it's the user's device, even though he's traveling, do not block him. So that would be a filter that we would apply to that rule. Uh, we can. Is it we possible can... to take? Well, if if we're talking about a map device, that's something we could filter down in in inside the rule itself. Um, but but would this be a device that has any type of mapping assigned to it? Or yep, yep, through unify. Is it unify? Yeah, through unify. Yeah, it's unify. map. Yep, and read the map to his MacBook or Windows eleven. Or so if I log in from Russia. I'm on my MacBook or let's say a Windows device. Uh, that should we can filter out and say do not block him because it is Enrique on his Windows 11 device. Yes, yeah, really. From from the filter, you can choose the Fortify Map device, and and we just have that condition equal to mapped or unmapped for that situation, and that would be something that would not block you upon uh, logging outside of your um, approved location. However, from your approved device. Awesome. I lost that one when that one got turned on because it wasn't working a while back. The the filter settings that are beneath the and or or gate, um, those those are different. Um, and, and and sometimes when I was learning the platform, I you know I didn't realize that there's a difference between the the filter settings. But when you're working with those and or, or settings inside the respond rules and you go to the right click that filter it gives you more granularity to drill in and and provide that level of detail things like you know the fortify activity that's taking place ip addresses um using the asn or countries and those different details as well and then can we add you could take a picture of my face when i open the laptop and make sure it is me <laughs> I'm sure there's something through PowerShell uh, that- Enrique, we couldn't afford the storage of, of maintaining all the pictures of you opening your laptop. I know. <laughs> we would have a new one for every meeting that we join with Enrique, for sure. It's another level of Unify. Um, yeah. That'd be, uh, that's, that would be good. Is, is there any um, filter logic to, for the, like the, the account type I had always uh, done a few things to try and avoid like uh, triggering on foreign, um, like guest, you know, guest sign-ins for like a shared SharePoint or OneDrive file. Um, the example. A, a filter. Well, again, you could actually build that in a respond rule by specifically guest sign in by looking at, you know, there's a consistent format to what a guest account looks like um, in the Microsoft universe. And you could construct right. that in respond rule and, and use that as a, to filter off. You could, you definitely could do that. There's okay. The obvious thing that you need is something that's consistent um, to, to make that catch all. 
Um, that's going to get a lot easier, Stephen, in about, um, I'm thinking three weeks, maybe four weeks at the outside. There's a project um, that the Respond team is working on now to add two different kinds of wildcards, both question marks um, and asterisks, so that you can string together um, much more detailed combinations of Right. I know some of that is in the works, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, for, yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll exclude things like, you know, SharePoint or like teams sometimes, but occasionally it still tri triggers, um, but stuff like that. Um, really looking forward to. Yeah, absolutely. Billy, I want to follow up on your um, comment, which is an interesting idea. I want to make sure that I understand um, what you're driving at. So when you say a 365 application ID, you're talking about an enterprise app um, that is installed in the domain, correct? That is correct. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's a. it's pretty easy for us to pick that data up. Uh, the one thing that I would worry about is the application ID might not be universal across all customers. It depends upon um, how the enterprise app itself gets installed. So... We'd have to look at that, um, but that's yeah, an in most cases we do see it pretty standard across all organizations. At least that use similar apps. Yep. Um, but I know doing it by you know, I believe Stephen posted a screenshot of uh, description details using the name is a uh, risky in itself. Yeah, we have a, a risk based rule. Um, yeah, for for example, um, and. Yeah, I yeah, I believe it is the description we're using. Yeah, I think that's something that we could add um relatively quickly, Billy. So again, I'd I'd encourage you to ping your account manager. Um obviously we'll we'll grab notes and stuff out of here, but ping your account manager and let them know that you'd love to see that. By the way, everything that we're talking about is potential new stuff. I'm making no promises that that's going to be 2024 roadmap. It's a pretty full roadmap already. Um, but this is a pretty good time to start getting your things in line um, for enhancements that you want in the 2025 roadmap. Cool. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> My yeah, and, uh, well, I, um, should, is it wrong to throw out like other data sources, like uh, things to connect to? Um, it's open office. All no, free. yeah, like, so you're talking about other SaaS apps you'd like us to connect to for monitoring. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, like SmartSheet. SmartSheet is has a lot of activity within it, and that, that's one thing that uh, yeah was at one option that yep. kept coming up. But uh, yeah, app requests like that we have SSO already, but um, you know some some visibility into I guess changes. And, yeah, um, Stephen, are you aware of our of our Nolt board? We have a public board where partners put oh, their ideas for sure. in. Yeah, yeah. So I would definitely plug them in the Nolt. Rally up every partner you know and try and get up votes on it. That that we actually do look at that and that bubbles things up into the uh, into the. Yeah, it's one of those line of businessy sort of deep apps people. for sure. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, okay. So, you know, we're look. I'm the. I'm the first one to admit that the evolution of this product, um, you know, it, it was mine and Seth's brainchild five years ago. Um, and from there, it's been evolved through the suggestions of our community, virtually everything that we've done. You know, you guys will get a laugh out of this, but I'm more of a data guy than a presentation guy. So when our analysis module that you guys see in there, that was originally named reports. As far as I was concerned, that was reports. I'm like, why would anyone need anything else other than being able to get a bunch of data piled up and export it to a spreadsheet and show it to their customers? And we learned really quickly that my view of the world is not the way MSP see things. And that's why you have a reports module that you can mail email stuff to your customers on your own logo and schedule and everything else. You know, So you guys come up with great ideas. We just try and implement them as quickly as we can. One yeah, last one I'd like to see... You know, more customer apps that you know as many customer apps as msp tools yep 
what how difficult is it Chip, to do API integrations to instead of emailing reports like we use cloud radio and finally connect secure gave me the 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 instructions on how to configure it so anytime a report's generated and connect secure you can email it as well but we go and save it in the cloud radio uh repository for the customer where we email SAS alerts reports into that repository but mm -hmm. it'd be great if just right straight into there instead of having to use the email version of it um and not that, i guess other saving tool or storage i mean do you, do you have to i don't know enrique anything about your organization do you have developers in staff not in this company i do in other companies okay um i mean our reports api allows you to do you know programmatically everything that we do in reports okay so you know, you th there's a general construct here that maybe um, folks aren't aware or necessarily aware of, and that is that our application itself obviously is a software as a service application. So the stuff that you guys look at on screen, all of it has an API behind it, um, and everything that you can do in SAS alerts um, on screen, you can do via our API. Almost everything. There's a couple of things that that aren't necessarily publicly exposed but for instance like rocket cyber may come to us and say hey we need to be able to do something with a specific endpoint that you guys haven't exposed and we can allow that to happen but we actually have partners out there who have effectively built their own sazzlers overlay um, that they share specific aspects of our product directly with their customers in their own portal and any of you guys could do that um because in order for us to actually generate what you see on screen, there has to be an API underneath that for everything. And 95% of that API is available to you guys uh, directly to do whatever you want with. Maybe Logan for the Brady Bunch, when they come back, maybe on a one office hours, we could take a general overview of, of the API integration just to get some some ideas. What do you call them, the Brady Bunch? Well, I just made up that up this morning when they weren't here. <laughs> so, there, so, so we have a swagger page, Enrique. Let me post this here in the chat. No, I've seen the swagger page, but maybe you all have some stuff. Me reading the swagger page is like reading in, in Mandarin. Yeah. So maybe, like maybe some type of demo of some basic things people are doing just to kind of get the blood flowing in the brain and. I think that's going to be probably a little bit outside the scope of, of this. Um, you know, that's that's getting into a, a coders slash engineering level discussion. Um, the most, but I'll say the easiest thing to do and the most common thing that people do is they use, are you, are you familiar with the term webhooks? Do you know what a webhook server is? Yep. So, the, you know, most of the consumption of, of data from SAS alerts is going via webhooks. Um, you set up a webhook server, you add the address, and you can do all this actually in our interface. You don't really need to be a hardcore API coder. You need to know, have somebody in your staff that can set up a webhook server, but you give us the address for that webhook server. Um, on your side, you'll control what information you want to receive, and you can either get you know, a stream that's client by client, or you can just get a fire hose that's all your data, or you can get only critical alerts, whatever you want to come across. And um, that's the most common usage of our API. And then people will take that data. Um, for instance, I know one partner for sure has built their own portal page for their customers that they use for all kinds of products, not just us. And when their customer logs into that portal page, if there's a critical or medium level alert that showed up in SAS alert for that customer, it's going to appear right on that customer's portal page. So, you know, they run a security business for more for enterprise size companies than the SMB space. So they're dealing with co-managed situations where there's a guy on the other end who is probably using that dashboard that his MSP has created in the same way you use the map, right? He's looking at that all the time. And they'll get a direct data feed um, coming into their company portal uh, that's provided by that MSP. Does that make sense? Yep. So... I think we're 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 running a little over here. Um, I'm good for about another ten minutes if you guys want to hang on, which we probably don't typically do on these office hours. But um, I'm also happy to go and get lunch if you're all all good. I need to go to my my roost rock call, guys. Great seeing you, Chip. Swing by a little more often, maybe twice a year, three times a year.
Well, next time you're you're going to be in Breckenridge, Ridge, let me know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll swing by out there. Definitely, I will. Thank you, guys. Great seeing you all. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Take care. Bye. Sounds good. You all have a great week. Yep. Thanks, Stephen.